Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Mom Hour Voices, episode 29. I'm Megan Francis, and today I'm going to be talking with working mom and author Jessica Turner about her new book, Stretched Too Thin, How Working Moms Can Lose the Guilt, Work Smarter, and Thrive. We have a great conversation coming for you, and we're going to talk about how to lose that guilt and make room in your life for things that matter. And the whole idea, is balance really a thing? I think we both agree it's not exactly the way it's presented to be. But before we dive into that interview, I want to talk about our sponsor, Victorious. Victorious is a way you can easily and conveniently take group fitness classes at your house or wherever you happen to be streaming on your computer, phone, tablet, or television. But what I think is really cool about Victorious is that unlike a lot of other fitness programs that are online, the classes are live and interactive. So you do have to register or like actually show up for the class on time. I find that having a specific time on my calendar makes it that much more likely that I'll actually do the class. And I love that they're live and interactive because when the instructor gives me a shout out when I come into the class, I definitely feel more motivated to stay and work hard through the whole class instead of doing that thing where I kind of wander away from the video and like go load the dishwasher. I don't know if you guys do that, but I definitely do when it's, you know, pre-recorded. There's a great menu of classes like yoga, boxing, cardio, high intensity interval training, and more. And here's another great thing. The classes are typically like 35 to 45 minutes, which is a great length for a busy mom. I've got about 40 minutes in the morning between when Owen and Will leave in the morning and then when Clara has to be up. So I signed up for Jared's core lab class. Uh, There's no way I could manage to get to the gym and back in 35 minutes, but it feels great to know that I can use that time that otherwise I might just waste really productively at home without having to leave with Victorious. You can also take unlimited classes every month for the price of a single fitness class. So we've got a special offer for you exclusively for our listeners. Get one free month of unlimited Victorious fitness classes when you sign up at victorious.com slash mom. That's victorious.com slash mom. And you're going to get to try Victorious free for one month. It's a great deal. So why not give it a shot? Okay, guys, let's jump right into the interview with Jessica Turner. Hey, Jessica, how are you doing? Thanks for being on the show. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So I was just thinking to myself that it had just been like, oh, I don't know, a year ago when we chatted last and I went and searched and it was 2015. You were on an episode of the Home Hour with me. It wasn't even the Mom Hour. I don't know that the Mom Hour had even launched yet. So it's been a while since your book, The Fringe Hours, came out. Um, So tell us a little bit about Stretch Too Thin and what what brought you to wanting to write this book and kind of like the journey that you took to get here. Yeah. So like you said, my first book, The Fringe Hours, Making Time for You, released in February of 2015. And I remember the date very well because I had a baby six weeks before launching the book. So it was like two births at one time. Mm -hmm. So I can measure my literary career by the age of my toddler. So he's (laughs) three and a half now. So it's been a bit of a gap. I needed a break, um, both because I went from two to three kids and because I just didn't know what I was going to write next. Next. Um, And so as I thought about what the next book would be, because I had signed a two book deal, I first thought I might write something like a experiment on slowing down or something like that. That was a topic that interested me. And then I realized that with having three children and a full time job and a writing career, that was just not possible. It just is not the season of life that I was in to like be taking these long Sabbath sabbaticals. Right, um, yeah. <laughs> and so I thought, you know, what do I know really well? And the answer was the working mom experience. I have a 40 hour Hour week corporate America job and uh, really resonate with hearing kind of how other working moms are doing all the things and feeling like they're thriving. And so I conducted an online survey about two years ago um, and had 2,000 working moms respond about their biggest wow. pain points of working motherhood and um, how they felt. And it was amazing. 500 pages of women basically saying over and over that they were stretched too thin and what area they were stretched too thin in was different, but the theme was still the same. And so I dove into that research and then developed an online course um, that was about working motherhood. It was called Stretch Too Thin, 10 Days to Overcoming the Hustle and Thriving as a Working Mom. And I talked about these different pain points and had 2,000 women take that course. So I was like, okay, so I think I've got something here, right? And so 
I took the data from the survey and I took the course to my publisher and I said, I really want to dive deeper into this topic. I think this is really resonating with people. And it was sort of counterintuitive in publishing. They want you to write a book that has a, a title that's very positive and is sort of like the the end result of reading the book, right. whereas the title stretched too thin was negative. And so yeah. that was something that I had to really push for that when women saw stretch too thin on the shelf, I really felt like they would pick it up, that this yeah. was something that was going to resonate with them since so many women used that phrase themselves in the, in the survey. And so um, they agreed and early feedback has been really positive about it. The subtitle is how working moms can lose the guilt, work smarter and thrive. And so I do the same thing I did in the course. And what I found in the survey was we just go through all of those challenges and it's a bit of me too. And yes, you can. So it's got stories from women who are right there um, in the muck and, and struggling with whatever the issue is and then um, gives practical stories and advice and um, wisdom from experts about how uh, you can maybe pivot and make changes so that you don't feel quite so overwhelmed in whatever the area is. So I'm really proud of it. I think it's a resource that's really needed and a conversation that we really need to be having. I mean, 75% of American women who have children under the age of 18 work. So most of us are dealing with this feeling of stretch too thin and and balancing and juggling and all of that. So um, I'm excited about having this conversation because I think it's important. I am too. And I have to tell you, um, one of the things that jumped out at me um, pretty early in your book uh, was you were talking about, you quoted someone was talking about the, I don't want to say spaghetti brain. That is not correct. Right. Compared a woman's brain to a plate of pasta. Can you, can you please give me this analogy so I don't screw it up? Yes, I, and I hope I get it right, right? Because it's been a while since I've written it. Um, but yes, basically, it's the idea that a woman's brain is like a plate of spaghetti and that so many things are interconnected. So you might be thinking about your son's sc- soccer schedule, but then that makes you think about, oh, he needs to get new cleats because they're too small. And then you think, oh, when I go to the store, I'm going to also pick up a tent for the camping trip that we're going to be going on. And mm-hmm. when we go on that camping trip, I need to make sure that I've booked the reservation for where we're going to be staying and all of that, that all of those things are interconnected, that it isn't, you know, segmented individual perfect squares, right? right? Yeah. And our brains are always like, uh, like anticipating. We're always kind of three Mm -hmm. steps ahead of every situation. Absolutely. Something else I talk about in the book is the mental load, which is just the um, constant remembering that we're doing of all of the things and that's going on in the background of our minds. And it's something that can be a big burden for particularly women. In most cases, it is um, the woman in the household who is carrying that mental load. And so I think those two really go hand in hand. So I have to tell you, I was just listening to um, a podcast called Startup. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. It's been around for a while. And it was uh, it was done by the guys who it was Alex Bloomberg. He had left um, This American Life and like started a podcast network. And then recently I listened to kind of the same, (laughs) basically the same idea. It's called Zigzag and it's two women who did the same thing. Also left a public radio show and started their own um, podcast. I think both podcasts are great. But what I find is so interesting is the way the dads in the one show, the startup podcast, talked about um, their stresses as as working dads was almost all tied to finances. It was just like, we're doing this really risky thing and we have kids and this is really risky. And that was kind of the end of the story. Whereas the moms keep saying, can I be a good mom? And I just mm-hmm. thought like, <laughs> what a big concept, like good mom, all of these things tied together to make you a good mom. Like, how do you parse it out? And it I think it also um, it, I thought of it when I read the spaghetti analogy, because there was another part that said we have a hard time not taking things emotionally because everything is so connected. So it's like, right. it's, you know, we're not just worried about getting them to school on time or daycare on time or paying the bills or feeding them. We're worried about all of those things almost equally as like the big picture of making us a good mom. It's so overwhelming, honestly. Right. And our definition of good mom is different, right? Every Mm -hmm. single woman, if you ask them, how would you define a good mom would probably say something just slightly different based on their own life experience and what their kids are like. And and so a lot of that is pressure that we're putting on ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. So let's dive into some solutions. So we all know it's a problem. (laughs) Granted, it's been set up. Um, Let's just talk. Let's kind of maybe take a few of the chapters that you have um, in the book and kind of go through those. I'm going to start with finding rhythm at work because Mm -hmm. I think sometimes it's easy to think of like work as something that happens over there and like 
home is something that happens over here and the two don't connect. But if you're not happy at work or if you're not, if you're feeling stressed at work, it always carries over. So talk about that chapter and, and some of the solutions that you've offered in the book. Yeah, you know, I think it's really interesting. And in the data, women didn't cite this as being uh, quite as big of a problem for them, leaving work at work or um, creating work boundaries. But I sort of felt like they were lying. (laughs) Like it was it was the one where it's hard for us to be honest or if we're not in that moment at that particular time, we maybe can't see it. But you're absolutely right. We The phrase work-life balance, I'm going to just start there, is such a lie, right? Right. Like there's no separate things. Like those aren't two separate things, work and everything else. Like if you are really busy at work, that's going to carry into your home life. If you are really overwhelmed at home or your kids have a lot going on, that is going to bleed into your work life. And so how do we create boundaries? How do we cultivate flexibility? Uh, You know, and it's different on if you work full time or part time, if you work at home or in an office. Um, But one of the big takeaways from my research is that increased flexibility is becoming more and more important for women. And that's going to look different depending on the career trajectory that you have. But how can you cultivate flexibility in your work, whether that is talking with your boss about coming in early so you can leave early so you can have more flexibility to be with your kids in the evening or, you know, carpool and and do that sort of thing with sports and, and those types of activities. Or can you have one work from home day? And what's interesting is, yes, more and more workplaces are being open to having the type of flexibility where you could have a work from home day, which saves you time in your commute. Research shows that people are more productive when they work from home. Um, But there's still a lot of workplaces out there who don't offer it. And so it might be that you need to be the first one to ask if that's a possibility. And what's I think encouraging is how many executives are willing to consider it and just do it as a pilot. And so you might have to be the first person to ask for it, but don't let that scare you into not doing it. Um, So I think flexibility is a big one. I think also if you are noticing that your work is becoming all consuming in all sorts of areas is evaluate, is it for a season or is this something that's going to be an ongoing thing? And if it is, if that's an issue to you, that maybe you need to pivot, whether that is a new job working somewhere else, or it is um, delineating some of that work and asking for help, being honest with your supervisor and saying, this is more than I can handle and not just living under that burden of constant work all of the time, because eventually that is going to impact every other area of your life, not just the time you're at home, but your relationships and how you feel about your work and um, how you are taking care of yourself. Yeah, I I love that advice. Um, I actually spent much of the last year um, in a full time job in addition to all the other things I have going on in a marketing agency. And it was my first time back in a, you know, nine to five type job for a very, very long time. And I think that my biggest lesson and I've moved on from there for many reasons. I think they're lovely people and it was a good job. I'm just I'm back to doing my own thing again. But one of the things I thought that I was really surprised to learn was that they weren't going to think of those things for me. Like they weren't going to take work off my plate. That was not going to happen. They weren't going to offer me to work at home. But when I asked and said, this is what I need, everybody was really open to it and actually kind of appreciative that I brought it up. It's just like everyone's busy and no one notices what's on your plate. Like you, you really have to be the squeaky wheel and say, this is what's going on with me. This is why the workload is too heavy, or this is why I need to be working from home and how it will benefit the company and all of those things. And once you do that, I found them to be very receptive. And I was afraid to ask for like six months and I could have made my life so much better, so much sooner <laughs> if I had just gotten ahead of it. Um, and I wish I had, but it's, I think that's a really important lesson that the workplace you're in might just because they haven't come up with it on their own doesn't mean they wouldn't be receptive. Right. And it's not even about being a squeaky wheel. It's about being your own advocate, right? Like you have to advocate for what is going to help you love your job the most, do the best work and live the life that you want to live. And so when you look at things through that lens, it can become really easy to say, okay, this is what I have to do. I know in my own career, when I was pregnant with my second child, my kids are now 10, seven and three and a half. And 
when my I was pregnant, I really thought about, OK, the agency that I was at, at was very, very 24 seven. We were always on from the moment we woke up to the moment we went to bed. I was checking email all the time and I was like, you know what? I don't think that I can continue at this pace. And so I'm going to have to either have some hard conversations or find a different job. And then I ended up getting a job opportunity that I was not expecting. And that's now where I still am. Um, but you need to have those hard conversations with yourself and with other people, I think. Yeah. Yeah, totally agree. Um, so there's some good advice in that chapter. Let's talk about chapter seven, parenting well. I think that that is something all moms feel like we fall down on the job on sometimes, right? But I think working moms especially feel that because we can't be there for everything um, and we have to prioritize. And that means sometimes not doing certain things. So um, tell me a little bit about like the takeaway there. When you talked to moms about their biggest struggles with parenting well, what came up and, and then what kind of solutions did you come up with um, in the book? Right. I like to say a lot that every chapter in Stretch Too Thin could be its own book. And certainly <laughs> yeah. there are many, many books on parenting well, right? So what what is the unique thing that you're going to get from Stretch Too Thin? I think it's the conversation around, like what you said earlier, that we all want to be good moms. And so it is approaching our relationships with our kids with intention. Mm. And I, I think if there's one takeaway from the Parenting Well chapter, it's that you are a good mom. I don't think anyone who is reading a book like Stretch Too Thin where they want to thrive and they want to feel less guilt. I, I think right there that that says that you're a good mom, that you love your kids um, and your kids know that you love them. And so I think it's just being intentional with your time with them, that when you are with your kids, you are with your kids. You're not checking email and, you know, working a little bit and kind of half paying attention, but being really present, um, being really honest with them. And that is being honest when you are in a busy season at work, but it's also being honest by apologizing if you've done something that, you know, you're not proud of. Like if I yell at my kids, you know, I'm quick to apologize and and teach them that that is normal and healthy behavior, right? right that, yes. that we need to apologize and ask for forgiveness and the freedom that comes when we apologize, right? That we aren't then feeling guilty about X, Y, Z thing that we did. And also, you know, being honest that sometimes our work is going to take precedence and that we will have to be traveling or we will have to be at a meeting or that we will miss something, but that is part of life and that work is part of life and, and teaching kids about respecting their work and um, the benefits of work. You know, my kids know that we I work so that we can, you know, help pay for our home and go on vacation and do things that they love, that that is um, part of my responsibility and, and my role as a mom to them is to provide for them. And so I think using opportunities to teach our kids why we're doing what we're doing is really important um, and, and just be willing to have good, honest conversations and, and have that quality time together is so important. You shared in the book a story about um, missing, I can't remember now the exact, you missed your daughter's a party at school maybe? And that really affected you emotionally. Yeah. Kind of a turning point of. Stuff? Yeah. I don't know if it was a turning point, but certainly the the example that I, I share that makes me cry all the time. I, I, hopefully I can share it now two years later without crying. But uh, the story is that um, my little girl had just finished kindergarten. You know, at kindergarten, they love doing those little packets where they draw. Um, about their favorite this and their favorite that. And um, she drew about her favorite memories from the year. And one of those memories that she drew was my husband coming and reading to the class. And when I saw that, instead of being so grateful that my kids have a dad who's involved in their school and, and that, that was something that was meaningful to her, I absolutely wept because it, um, it, I, I looked at it and I said, I started crying and I said to my husband, she's going to remember me in an office and you in her class. Mm. And that really bothered me, even though I love my work mm -hmm. and I will always work. And um, my little girl was there when I started crying and she said, I'm so sorry, mommy. I should have drawn a picture of when you came for the Valentine's party because I'm a present mom. Right. Like, I mean, I, I came for lunches and I, I still did the things even though I worked. Um, 
And, and, but that mom guilt just kind of swallowed me in that moment. And I think we all have those moments, right? Um, and my husband was so kind and said, you know, our kids are not going to ever think about you and equate it with them having a mom who wasn't present. Right. Like that is not the kind of mom that you are. And, and we know that, right? Like sometimes we just need someone else to say that to right, us. But exactly. I think it was a a reminder of that I want my kids to know that I'm there and mm -hmm. to feel my presence and and you know what she was five like right. she just drew what came to her in that moment you know well, it wasn't sure. any sort yeah. of like big thing but to me it was monumental that I wasn't represented there yeah. um, and we all have those things and so I think that we need to just use those emotions from when when those feelings come up and say where's this coming from do I need to make changes or do I just need to kind of hit the reset button mm -hmm. yeah I I totally agree and I think that you know we those can be like educational moments, right? When we feel like, ugh, like that feeling in your gut, like, is it just that I'm feeling vulnerable right now and it kind of caught me off guard that I wasn't in this picture or is there really something I need to reevaluate? And I always want to say like, you can always change things. If you feel like the balance, like you said, balance doesn't exist, <laughs> but there's that yin and yang, that give and take. And if you feel like the give and take is off for too long to the point that it's affecting things, you get another chance to fix it. Like it's not done. Like you missed one thing. Okay. That's not like the end of the world. And it's not like you'll never have another chance, but it's like an opportunity more than it is a, a judgment of you or, you know, like at the end, like a verdict, you know, <laughs> like this is what your life as a mom was like. And I hate that idea that we're um, often like looking back and taking score about ourselves when really we should be looking forward to see how we can make things better for us and and for our kids. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, Jessica. So we've talked about, um, you know, creating more, I guess, balance. I hate that word balance. Is there a better word? Can we talk about like, <laughs> yeah, we can talk about that. Okay. So I hate the word balance as well. And this is not my word. I read about it in another book that I really need to find that book and give that person credit. But um, somebody, some smart person said, instead of work-life balance, it's work-life satisfaction. Ooh, I no, love I that, that. Right. Uh huh. Because, and yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, you know, there's going to be seasons where you're working a lot, but if you're working a lot and your work is bringing you joy and you feel satisfied, like that's OK that things are a little off. Just like if you are doing really intense projects at home and things are really busy, it's it's overall. Do you have satisfaction in all of those different areas of your life? So I that, really love looking at things through the lens of satisfaction, not balance. That is fantastic. I love that because I've honestly thought that sometimes the times of my life that I'm happiest are when I'm whole hot or like wholeheartedly into something either really into my work or kind of taking one of those relaxed seasons from work and really being involved with my kids and um, slacking off a little bit at work you know not to like a, a detrimental degree but you know how you there's times when you can kind of ride those those waves and those are sometimes the happiest times of my life and they're completely out of balance it's like there's no balance whatsoever so yeah no, nobody has a day where like everything gets equal attention it just doesn't exist Absolutely. Well, Jessica, I definitely want to keep this conversation going. This has been really great so far, but we're going to take a quick sponsor break. Hey guys, it's Sarah here and I need to confess something. I know in an ideal world, we're serving our families a home cooked dinner every night where everybody eats the same thing and sits around the table to eat it together. But I know in my family that ideal happens about twice a week. The rest of the time, for various reasons, my kids are eating something different from the grownups. We recently got to try Yumble, a nutritious meal delivery service for kids that I think could be a lifesaver for those busy seasons where you know ahead of time that the kids won't be eating from the adult menu, but when you still want to keep nutrition a priority. We have back to school night this week, plus some trips coming up where the grandparents will be staying with the kids, and it's so nice knowing there's an option like Yumble. The meals come ready to eat, no cooking required, and can be heated to serve in just 60 seconds. Think old school TV dinners with menu options kids love, only these are nutritionist approved and made with hormone-free proteins, whole grains, and superfoods. We loved the cheeseburger empanada, and the protein poppers made a perfect after-school snack. Yumble was founded by a mom who wanted to create a company that helps out other moms, something we feel pretty passionate about ourselves over here. If you're entering a crazy time of life, a new baby, a move, or some other situation where you know family meals are going to be a challenge, why not give yourself the gift of nutritious kids' meals delivered to your door? 
No scrambling to make a burned grilled cheese at the last minute or order pizza again. Head to yumblekids.com and use promo code MOMHOUR30 at checkout to get 30% off your first two weeks. That's yumblekids, Y-U-M-B-L-E-K-I-D-S.com and promo code MOMHOUR30 to save 30% off your first two weeks. Hey guys, Megan here. So you might know that I wear contacts and I think I've shared before that I am terrible about remembering to make appointments to get my prescription renewed when I get close to running out. And actually my prescription doesn't change that often anymore. So it's kind of a hassle to have to make an appointment, pay a hundred bucks for an exam when I know they're just going to keep it the same. That's why I love simple contacts. Simple contacts can check and verify your prescription using your phone or your computer in less than five minutes. There's licensed ophthalmologists that look at your eyes to make sure they look healthy and that your vision hasn't changed. And the exam is just 20 bucks. So if everything checks out, you can actually order from a huge selection of contact lenses right on the website. And they have all the same brands and styles you would expect to have at your optometrist's office. Um, It's important to remember this isn't a replacement for your periodic full eye health exam. You're going to need to do that and get all that stuff checked out. But Simple Contacts is a great way to test that your current prescription still helps you see 2020 and can renew that prescription. So still make sure you're regularly seeing your eye doctor in person, but this is a great way to kind of fill those gaps between those appointments. So we have a great offer for you guys, 20 bucks off your contacts. Go to simplecontacts.com slash themomhour20 and enter the code themomhour20 at checkout. Again, that's simplecontacts.com slash themomhour20 and enter the code themomhour20 at checkout to get $20 off your contacts. I promise you, even without that $20 off, This saves so much time and money anyway that it's totally worth checking out. I love it. So again, simplecontacts.com slash themomhour20, the code themomhour20. Check it out, guys. Okay, guys, let's get back to it. So again, I'm talking with Jessica Turner. She's the author of Stretched Too Thin, How Working Moms Can Lose the Guilt, Work Smarter, and Thrive. And Jessica, so we talked about parenting and kind of um, getting, getting to a place where you feel good about the parent you are and like what you can do for your kids more than focusing on what you maybe aren't doing right now, or, you know, the fact that you can't be everywhere at once. We also talked about creating rhythm at work so that you're feeling like you've got enough time to do the things that are on your plate, that maybe you have the flexibility that you need. Let's shift gears a little bit and let's talk more, I guess, introspective, um, Let's talk about relationships, both. I know you've got two chapters in here about relationships, one about friendships and one about marriage. Um, And I feel like those often are the things that fall off. Like we know we're going to parent our kids. We know we're going to show up for work. And those outside relationships, it's easy to start neglecting those. Even your marriage, which is right in front of you all the time, it's so easy to take for granted. So tell us a little bit about those two chapters and maybe some takeaways. Yeah, it was tricky deciding whether or not to include the marriage chapter because I was really sensitive that there's a lot of working moms out there who are not married. Um, But in the survey, so many women cited it as being a challenge for them that Mm -hmm. their spouses were just kind of like ships in the night that, you know, they were just keeping everything else on the tracks and that they weren't investing in their marriage that I felt like it was important to acknowledge that relationship. Um, And so I think, again, over and over, I feel like I keep saying the same thing. It's about being intentional, right? It's about prioritizing the date night. It's about looking each other in the eye when you're talking. It's about having honest conversations, not letting things build up, you know, um, being forthright about the mental load and what's going on in your head and that you need help and and those types of things. Um, I I think so often when I've had... um, challenging seasons in my marriage it's been seasons where we haven't been communicating well mm-hmm. um and so uh, it, the chapter just goes through kind of some of those different struggles i talked with some marriage therapists and some counselors and um got what i thought was some pretty sound advice if that's um an area that a working mom feels like um is a struggle and then when it comes to friendship i think for so many of us we are so busy that it can feel like investing in one more person is too overwhelming. And so I said, you know, start small with kind of right where you are. If you are fortunate to work in a job where there's other people, where you're not self-employed, you know, taking time to dig deep in those relationships at my job a couple years ago, we started a book club. And we just get together at someone's house every other month. So it's not 
very often, six times a year. And, you know, you're going to miss one or two of those anyway. And it has just been such a great way to get together outside of work. And there's something special about being in someone's home and cook, eating the food that they cook and um, having a unifying device like a book to talk about. Um, that's been so great for relationship um, and friendship in the office. I think looking at our kids' activities, some of the greatest friends that I have in my life um, have come out of kids' sports activities because we're there anyway cheering our kids on and so you can't help but get to know one another and so um, looking for a friendship where it can happen right I think and then um, not being afraid to be vulnerable and say hey let's go get a coffee and get to know one another better you know it's a lot harder than it was when we were in college and we were all living in a dorm together isn't it Um, but it is just as important um, to cultivate those relationships I think that's so funny when I was working um, in my office job and with people, I really liked my team, but I found that I went into this, and I'm wondering how common this might be, that I went into this total, like, um, hyperproductive mom mode at work and would not take time. It was a while before I realized I wasn't taking time to get to know people. I wasn't mm-hmm. even taking time for, like, the hallway niceties, because in my mind, it was like, I have a job to do. And I was multitasking, like, not multitasking even, but it just, like, I was so... um oriented on getting the job done and being efficient just the way I have always been at home with a big family and working from home and things like that, that I was missing out on one of the benefits of being in, in a workplace in the first place. And I wonder how common it is for moms to kind of switch mentally into that, like get her done mode and miss out. I mean, I had to be there all day anyway. (laughs) I might as well have benefited from some of the water cooler chatter. And I felt almost weird or guilty about taking part in that because it was like, I have a job to do. And would go into this alt, like ultra efficient mode. And I think I did miss out on some deeper, you know, forming some deeper friendships. I totally can relate to that because at the job that I'm at now, I started out there in a cubicle. So I was by myself in this cubicle and it was like head down, get my work done. And then I got moved into an office um, with somebody else. And it was supposed to be like a benefit. Like we're taking you out of the cubicle and you're going to be in an office and you're going to have a window. And I was so annoyed that I was going to have to share an office (laughs) with somebody. And she was probably like going to talk to me, you know, and like (laughs) now she's one of my very best friends. And like I would ball my eyes out if she ever left and so uh yeah there's definite benefit to that i had um uh, surgery the summer was on medical leave and i was so ready to get back to work because i noticed i was feeling lonely by the end of that six week leave um that i was really missing that community so that's definitely a benefit um if you are somebody who works in an office or in a retail setting or whatever just that collaborative and environment of being around other people and i think so i think for so many moms um I know for myself, both when I was working, you know, when I've been working at home for many, many years and even when I was um, a stay at home mom for a brief season of my life, I so much of my friendship and interaction was online. And so I got used to that being sort of my social network. And so like the idea of just walking through an office and stopping to chat with someone's like face (laughs) was like foreign to me almost. (laughs) And also you can't control it. If they want to come by and say hi to you, you don't get to ignore Like, it's not like a Facebook message where you could just pretend you didn't see it until you're ready to sit down and and answer it. I just think there's something funny about the way our brains work now when everything is digital, um, that we are sort of missing that ability to just like be present and chat with somebody whenever. It's kind of like how people don't want to answer their door anymore when someone knocks on the door. It's like it gets it's like offensive almost because someone's coming to our space. And what do you mean? But like, I feel like our mothers would not understand that at all. So it's just kind of we're in like a very different. Um, very different place societally, I think. And I think that can make it hard to shut off that productivity to do that. But I like that you um, are advocating for that because it is important. I heard a statistic on the news the other day that said by 2020, we will interact more with chat bots than we will with our spouses. Oh, my goodness. I know. That's, like That's not really that far away. Thing. That's scary. I know. <laughs> like chat bots, like, you mean they like do, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, you know, I think like, yeah, just service providers that are done by chat that, you know, oh. there's more and more services that are like text your appointment right. and whatever that those Ooh. types of things that will interact more with those than with our spouses. Well, that's depressing. We have to make scary. sure it doesn't happen. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about self-care. Um, that is such a buzzword. I think sometimes it's sort of meaningless the way it's used. So I would, you know what I mean? Like, hey, get self-care, go get a massage. And you're like, I can't even, I don't have time to like 
go to the bathroom. How am I going to do that? So let's talk about self-care in real life with like the real working mom. How does that look? And what did you find when you were talking to moms about that? It's interesting because I wrote The Fringe Hours, which is a book solely dedicated to self-care, right? It is all about making time for you. And the data from the survey showed that a lot of those women needed to read that book (laughs) because it was the it was the number one thing. Four out of five working moms cited that making time for themselves and the things that they were passionate about was difficult with managing a home and family and work. And so I think it is a shift in philosophy that, you know, we really embrace the oxygen mask analogy that they Mm -hmm. give on the airplane that you put on your own oxygen mask before you help the person next to you. And that by taking care of ourselves, it is actually allowing us to be a better wife, mom, friend, coworker. Everything is better when you're taking care of yourself. And so I really dive into the data that supports that and then just what that looks like from a physical standpoint of going and getting checkups and going to the dentist and and doing those types of things as um, well as things that are stimulating mentally and emotionally and spiritually and um, that really just fill us up because it does absolutely make a huge difference in every other area of our life when we are taking time to do the things that we love and practicing self-care. Yeah, I like that you that you link um, doing the things that you love and self-care together. I think that's really important and I don't think everybody always connects those dots. Um I think people tend to think of self-care as kind of fluffy, like bubble baths. (laughs) And those are great. I love bubble baths. I absolutely love them. But, you know, bubble bath isn't going to get me in front of the doctor to have my skin screened to make sure like this mole isn't a problem. You know what I mean? Like those are the things that keep you thriving and are so important. And we tend to put those things off and and, you know, doing things that you love is so important for your mental well-being and emotional well-being too and I just think it's really important that that's part of the conversation about self-care so I appreciate that it's also really important to model for our children yes so when we think about it in the context of motherhood it is important for our kids to see us taking care of themselves so that they grow up to be adults who take care of themselves right like we would never let our kids skip their annual physical skip their dentist appointments right so why would we model that for them and right. and think that you know in adulthood you don't do those things right. it's and really like important for them to, to see that mm-hmm. yeah absolutely yeah. yeah well we started with talking about finding rhythm at work and i want to kind of take it full circle and end by talking about your home um i know that when i i've always really especially as someone who worked from home for a very long time and has worked from home for a long time I've always really loved creating like a homey haven, even though I'm not a great housekeeper. I just like there's certain things I enjoy about it. But when I took on a full time job, my house fell like right off. like, mm-hmm. And it was really hard on me. I did not like enjoy coming home to my home anymore. I didn't feel like it was a haven anymore. There were rooms I never went in. I stopped having people over like all of those things just almost kind of got boxed and like sh- like compartmentalized and shoved away for another day. And at some point I realized like, if I continue to work outside the home at some point, I'm going to want to enjoy my home when I come home to it. So I'm wondering if you find that that is a common struggle um, with working moms and then and then some solutions or some takeaways from your book. 100% it's a common struggle. Um, Self-care and home management were basically tied. Both of them uh, were four out of five moms found it to be difficult. It is absolutely my biggest pain point. So um, in in some ways it, it was hard for me to write that chapter because it is an area that I struggle with um, tremendously. It is it is not something that I want to give my precious time to um, it, and, you know, kind of housekeeping and that sort of thing. And so what I've learned and what a lot of moms have started doing, it seems like, is delegating that, you know, having cleaners come in, having, you know, assistance in that area. Um, It's interesting. Moms who have little kids like daycare age, those who have nannies who come into their homes seem to be less stressed than those whose kids went to daycare because the nannies kind of helped with some of that upkeep and, you know, doing the dishes and vacuuming and and doing that sort of thing. Whereas the moms whose kids were in daycare, you know, they came home and had to do all of those things as well. So, yeah. 
Um, you know, I think it's putting systems in place that are going to work well for you and recognizing that systems that you see in Real Simple Magazine or Better Homes and Gardens might not be the right system for the way your family um, lives in your home. And so being willing to make changes to systems you put in place if they're not working, um, organizational systems. There was one example in the book where the professional organizer talked about how people really like how glass jars look in a pantry. You know, you've got your oatmeal in there and your flour and your sugar, um, but some people really hate filling them. And if you hate filling the jars and then you've got like the cases of flour and the boxes of Cheerios and whatever sitting next to the glass jars, then that is not an organizational system that's going to work for you. So really figuring out what is going to work for you. I think being ruthless about purging um, and getting rid of stuff and getting rid of clutter that when you've got clutter in your home, that clutters your mind and overwhelms helps you um but then I think also being okay with imperfection and just embracing that, you know what, this is the season of life that we're in and, and it's okay. Like there are going to be piles on my coffee table. And if my neighbor is going to judge that, then you know what, I don't really want to be hanging out with her. You know, yeah. like this is just the season that it, it is. Um, yeah. And, you know, making sure that our family is pitching in and helping that, that the work of the home should not just um, be the burden of the mother. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and so having, chore charts or conversations or task lists, however you do it in your home to make sure that everyone is pitching in. Um, we do a speed clean. We try to do it every night. It doesn't happen every night, but we try to, you know, right before bed, all right, let's take five minutes and neaten up the living room so that when we come down in the morning, it's, you know, not chaotic and that sort of thing. Yeah. So um, I think pitching in and teaching your kids that responsibility is also important and can lead to less stress and, and feeling a a bit less overwhelmed and, and, and it's good for them to feel that sense of contrib like contribution and we're all in this together and maybe they'll think twice before they leave a bowl in the living room again if they always have to pick it up like whatever that is you know it's really important um to have everybody like a team in there and you know one thing i think that i was sort of uh, i fell victim to a little bit when i started working outside and inside the home is sort of a little bit of magical thinking about how much i could fit into a week and I finally had to say, like, I only have really three hours in the evening. If you really consider by the time I get home and then I'm like passing out at nine o'clock. Right. So I have like three good hours. I cannot use them all cleaning and grocery shopping. I can't. So <laughs> something has to give. And I started um, I started ordering, getting groceries uh, delivered because that was one thing that t that saved me like at least an hour. And probably like the most miserable hour because I would have been with all the other working people who just got out of work at the grocery store. And, you know, having a cleaning person come in, nothing feels as good as walking in to a house somebody else cleaned. So <laughs> it is so true. And and I feel like such a better use of my time. Like when my um, cleaning ladies come, they come just twice a month. And but it's three or four of them, depending on yes. the week. And so I'm and they're here two hours. I'm like, that's six hours, which really would have been like nine hours yeah, for me to get all of those it. things. They're, they're, no. no, they have their systems down. You would have taken mm -hmm. twice as long. Any, Absolutely. Those hours. Yeah. Like it's the best, best money I spend every month is having them come. Um yeah. So it it is interesting, though, because my kids have had to learn like that is a luxury and that yes. that, you know, we need to be grateful for that. And we've had conversations, you know, like my little three year old is like, are the cleaning ladies coming? And I'm like, no, you need to do that. Right. <laughs> so yeah. a little yeah. teaching moment there as well. I liked what you said about, you know, how families who have nannies feel a little bit um, less stressed as well, because I um I had for a little while a sitter just coming for just an hour and a half in the morning. So I just realized like. The morning rush, it would be better if someone else handled that so that I didn't have to truncate my work day or tack on hours at the end. It just mm -hmm. made more sense for someone to come and do that. And all she would do is just kind of tidy up. Like she didn't do a ton of cleaning. It wasn't like deep cleaning, but she would get the kids off to school and tidy up. And just that amount of help, it only equaled like seven hours a week or something. So it wasn't a huge financial investment for me. Um, but coming home and having all the breakfast dishes done and knowing I didn't have to make the breakfast and I didn't have to be the one to make sure the lunches ended up in the backpacks, like it was such a burden off. So sometimes like a small, a relatively small thing can take a big burden off and it might be a bigger impact than you think.
Absolutely. I feel that way about cleaning. I feel that way about laundry. I feel that way about like tasks that have been on my to-do list for a long time. I feel that way about systems where everything can be delivered. Like you said, the groceries, my groceries are delivered. All of my paper products are delivered. Like everything just comes to me. It saves me so much time to not have to go into a store. And frankly, it saves me money too, because I'm not impulse buying things that I don't need. (laughs) You're so right. Well, Jessica, this has been great. Again, Again, the book is stretched too thin. How working moms can lose the guilt. Work Smarter and Thrive. And let's see, this is releasing on September 7th. So the book itself releases when? It releases September 18th. So you've got a bit of time to pre-order. And if you pre-order, the great thing about it is that you'll actually get some bonuses. You'll get a free audio book. You'll get the audio book version of Stretch Too Thin. And you'll get the course that we talked about, um, the 10-day online course for free. So all of that is available at stretchtothinbook.com. Stretchtothinbook.com. And if you're listening to this before September 18th, hurry up and get over there so you can get those freebies. That is awesome. Well, thank you, Jessica. It's been wonderful having you on um, and best of luck with the book launch. Thank you so much for having me.